Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's conversation on advanced manufacturing, the sector's trends, including technology adoption on cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, digitalization, global markets, and international trends. I'm Ulrike Bargedalia, the Senior Director of Digital Economy, Technology and Innovation here at the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. And I'll be moderating today's conversation to which I greatly look forward. Without further ado, I would like to introduce you to the four esteemed speakers and panelists I will be joined by today. There would be Matt Ambrose of BDO. We have Mehdi Merai of Deloitte. Glenn Millard of EDC and Alexandre Blanc of VARS, which is an RCGT cybersecurity subsidiary. So, in light of, if I may say, Cybersecurity Awareness Month, and in the spirit of cybersecurity, Alexandre, may I ask you to start introducing yourself and provide some opening remarks? And then I will move on to the next speaker. Alexandre, the floor is all yours, please. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, happy to be there. So I'm Alexandre Blanc. I'm a VCSO at VARS, as we said, working in our uh, cybersecurity branch of uh, Raymond Chabot, Van Dorton. And uh, we are going to cover today an interesting topic about the industry 4.0 and uh, the industrial revolution. And this is quite a challenging topic, and I like it very well because this is the convergence of technology and industrial world where we are going to bring automation from the IT side of things to the industry side of things. And while it's improving the productivity of the industry and bringing some tremendous opportunities for the market, it's also coming with a lot of challenges on the cybersecurity side of things. And maybe a world that we're used to see in IT cybersecurity, but not in the industrial field. So I'm very happy you brought me on that side of things beside the all uh, wonderful things that this field is bringing, I'm also going to warn and bring so some watchdog approach on this field. So that will be my take. And I guess we're going to speak a little bit more about this in the next questions. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alexandre. We look forward to those insights for sure. Uh, may I move uh, to my next square on the screen, which uh, Midi of Deloitte, if you could please introduce yourself and your theme. Thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, Mehdi Mirai joined uh, Deloitte uh, recently. I used to be like uh, the former CEO of Data Formers, uh, specialized in artificial intelligence applications and machine learning uh, deployment. Uh, very big interest in uh, the industry 4.0. We had like experience, like Canadian experience and also international uh, and Asian experience like on manufacturing. And I would like to share an interesting momentum that the Canadian manufacturing sector uh, could catch today and it could have heavy and positive impact on the Canadian economy and where we can like uh, play an active role on, uh, on this transformation. So looking forward for your question and I will share with you some insights. Thanks. Thank you, Nadi. Looking forward to that too. And I had the pleasure to work with you previously on AI and artificial intelligence engagement. So fantastic. Thanks. Moving over to the global side of things and Thanks. expert markets, Glenn Miller, Glenn Miller, PDC, if you could please introduce yourself. Perfect. Thank you very much. And, and I want to begin by thanking the chamber and my fellow panelists for the opportunity to be here. Um, as mentioned, my name is Glenn Millard, and I'm the Regional Vice President for Ontario for Export Development Canada. So, you know, given the given the role that I play, manufacturing and Industry 4.0 obviously is is very close and near to near and dear to our priorities. Today, I'm going to focus my participation in the discussion by trying to bring the international trade angle to the conversation. Our organization, EDC, we've been, uh, we have a long history of supporting manufacturing in Ontario and Quebec and across the country. Um, as Canada's export credit agency, we are dedicated, of course, to helping Canadian companies succeed on the global stage. So we do that by, you know, equipping them with the tools they need, whether that be trade knowledge, financial services, equity, insurance connections, anything to grow your business with confidence. And so when we think of the advanced manufacturing sector, um, Right off the bat, Canada benefits from one of the best R&D environments in the world. And uh, we, you know, to complement 
environment, that R&D environment that are willing to work. And so you know, to look at examples of that, there's several of them. Probably the you know one of the most uh, innovative and getting a lot of attention these days is the Kitchener-Waterloo ex- region. Um, it, it's quickly emerging as a global leader in these new segments of the sector, including you know systems integrations, AI, as Mehdi mentioned, sensors, machine vision, and automation. So um, we're very excited about the sector and excited to be here today. And uh, you know, as we do, still all find ourselves stuck in this challenging and unpredictable economic environment as we continue to emerge from the uh, global health pandemic and the rest of the world continues. We see a very strong manufacturing sector emerging, and so we're very excited to have that opportunity to speak today to take that sector and this group to uh, to the globe. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Glenn, thank for you very that. Much. And for that. And you, you broke up slightly once in a while, but maybe it was just me. So I was staying close to the mic, and I myself won't move much uh, in order to ensure we have good sound here. Apologize. Not to worry, we, we just want the benefit of the, the audience to benefit from all your knowledge to ensure we all can hear you really well. And uh, Matt, last but not least from BDO, you and I talked a lot about various areas of tech adoption and digitalization leading up to this conversation. So please, the floor is all yours. Great, thanks Ulrich and pleasure to be here. Thanks for joining everyone. Matt Ambrose, I'm a partner in our uh, BDO's management consulting practice. and. I focus on digital transformation and value creation. Been consulting for over 24 years around the world, uh, public, private, not-for-profit organizations. I do a lot of work in the manufacturing and distribution space, process, discrete, et cetera. Uh, and really happy to be here and, and wanted to talk about just you know level setting and the, the accelerated adoption and deployment of, of technology by Canadian manufacturers has had a, a tremendous impact improving the quality and, and reducing costs and improving time to market with new products and services uh, and expanding the sales channels. There are many new emerging technologies being leveraged to, in today, including uh, internet, uh, um, industrial internet of things, uh, modern analytics, uh, artificial intelligence is a hot topic, um, hardware and software robotics, and uh, artificial reality and virtual reality, 3D printing, modern workplace, the list goes on. So. Um, we're at the cusp of technology, and I must admit, in light of COVID, I always like to say technology adoption has been advanced by uh, five to ten years. So, uh, looking forward to the to the dialogue today. And um, you know, with that being said, we'd be remiss if we didn't consider the cybersecurity consider uh, risks and considerations. So, uh, I'm looking forward to Alexander's uh, uh, commentary on that as well. Thank you very much, Matt, <laughs> for talking about tech adoption. I'm trying to adopt you my, my mic and mute button. Uh, let's get used to that. And um, you and I spoke about, I mean, you gave a whole range of uh, what tech should be or could be adopted. And I can envision that a lot of companies uh, might be a little bit in catch up mode or even to start thinking about it. So perhaps may I ask you, what's your advice to those companies who wish to start their journey on digital acceleration or adoption and transformation and those that are trying to catch up? Maybe you can go into a little bit more detail there. Yeah, sure. So regardless of your status, every organization needs a plan. Uh, So you know where you're going and how you're gonna get there. Uh, Recognizing the world continues to evolve and uh, your plan needs to be flexible and adapt. Your plan needs to have a a short-term tangible focus on six to 18 month initiatives um, that identify the quick wins and and demonstrate progress, Uh, provide insights and uh, energize and enable your workforce and contribute to the bottom line while still aligning with your your longer term strategic three to five year initiatives. uh, Most organizations indicate that their resources are overworked uh, which is a common challenge. And, and many automation solutions are available, such as RPA, robotic process automation, um, which can free up resources. It's a quick, easy solution. You can put in free, free up resources uh, so that they can then focus on higher value added tasks versus the mundane data entry that, that a lot of them are doing today in the industry. Uh, you can also just, uh, or you also can't just focus on technology. 
we tend to look at things through a people process, technology, data, and cybersecurity lens. And as they're the primary, primary levers that uh, need to work together, recognizing technology can't be the, or can be the driver or the enabler of change. If your organization uh, has adopted technology over the years, then you're more likely leveraging tech as an enabler. Uh, however, if you're stuck in the world of legacy, and then you can leverage technology as a driver of change. It, noting solutions have evolved considerably over the years and providing significant advancements in processes and efficiencies, uh, which have a wealth of, uh, uh, which ultimately contribute to your bottom line. Uh, those, those that are more advanced, you have a wealth of data that can, can be leveraged and, and uh, automated through sensors, uh, analytics, artificial intelligence, that, that can drive timely decisions or, or even give you opportunities to monetize the data providing new services. Uh, a lot of organizations don't consider that aspect. Uh, many manufacturers are using artificial uh, um, uh, uh, intelligence uh, or, or augmented reality uh, to provide training and, and support um, conveniently and cost effectively. That's, that's a game, ch game changer for organizations. If you look at a simple example, such as Boeing, um, when they had to uh, put some, an engineer on, on a plane and fly them to Australia to fix an engine versus using augmented reality. And they sit in their living room, frankly, nowadays and just walk somebody through the process. Uh, very cost effective and instant access versus potentially weeks and months of scheduling. Another important consideration is the people. You don't tend to, to they don't tend to like change. And you, you need to consider the change management implications as well as the resource pool um, that's available in the market. I've worked with many organizations that indicate they struggle to, to attract and retain appropriate talent. And there are many options available to align at your respective needs. Uh, however, when you're recruiting, I, I urge you, don't, don't focus on what was needed in the past, focus on the future and where you're going. Uh, this is a common pitfall for organizations as they continue to look for uh, the capabilities that are that were needed yesterday versus what they need to enable to support the business of tomorrow. Wow, thank you very much. That's a lot of insight and advice. Uh, so, uh, you know, now we need to implement as well. And you touched upon uh, resources, human resources, tech resources. Later on, I will ask you about funding resources as well. <laughs> That's another important element. Um, I would like to move on from here um, to, to you, Midi, um, tech adoption. Um, and Matt, you mentioned uh, various times artificial intelligence as well. And Midi, I know that is also your, your, your field of passion expertise, and I know so much more, but AI and the advanced manufacturing um, uh, sector, why? Why is it important? What are the benefits and what might be the hurdles and obstacles? that come along with it. So what do you have to share um, on okay. that front with us? So I think I, I will start with the why. Uh, we know that manufacturing, for example, in Canada represent more than 10% of, of, of the revenue of the country and of the labor. And it's a very important sector. And we can see like how critical this sector just by remembering like the COVID-19, the first months when it happened, and we see like the disruption that when when like manufacturing like sector is disrupted, it can disrupt almost every aspect of our life. What's interesting about um, artificial intelligence, and which is something that happened like only a few years ago, uh, if if we recall AI and the boom of ML and deep learning, it happened like 2015, and when it was like a very bizarre piece of the of tech and of science uh, at that time and a lot of progress happened on only very few years so we moved from the trend where things are done in in research labs to very operation program pro pragmatic like uh, technology that we can deploy today in manufacturing so we are in a momentum, I think, where we are moving from the early adapters, those organizations that adopt these technologies to enable like visual, visual like intelligence, uh, could be like uh, automation, like operation that could help manufacturing and to 
a vast majority. We are seeing like some enablement technology. For example, I can I can call like one of the technology we are working with uh, within Deloitte that helps like the customer to enable like their project a little bit faster than starting from the scratch. So there is this kind of accelerator we call it uh, within Deloitte helps a lot like uh, manufacturers to to be ready to get very fast and in a flexible way and very affordable way into like the capacity of, of the AI. I can give you some of the example that I personally worked in like with my teams. Uh, we worked a lot, for example, on automation uh, in, in relation with the quality control and quality insurance. Think about any manufacturer organization, right? We have today like the need of, I, th I think like the future is real time and customize it. And today we need to adapt to this reality. Customer is asking for very specific like needs and we have like sometimes surge of production. How, how fast I can adapt like my production pace to this like uh, reality. If you think about, for example, mask, N95 mask manufacturing, for example, you know, there is a surge that happens. We need to adapt, like, to be able, like, to provide to the society, like, the products uh, and the units they need. How much I can increase, like, the production pace? I can increase the machines, but can I increase in the same time, like, the human factor as fast as I can with the machines? Clearly, no. So the automation helped, like, to match, like, this kind of gap. And the tools today are available. Most of the cloud like technology is very affordable and accessible. Uh, the IoT uh, devices and technology become very affordable and it's almost it's almost today a commodity, right? And the AI part on a, like on top of all of that, we have like technology that we can like enable like manufacturing in very few number of weeks, by the way. So that's the momentum, and I think. Uh, I think Canadian is well positioned like, to take part of this opportunity. Well, that again sounds like a whole portfolio and rainbow of wonderful things to consider and do. You look into the future. Where did we come from? Where are we now? Where can we go? Where could we be at? And let me just ask a follow-up question, maybe. I mean, a lot of uh, companies might ask themselves, why does it matter to me particularly why, why that technology and why now? Um, you talked about acceleration, cost savings, but what are some maybe obstacles, hurdles? I mean, there are a lot of challenges and opportunities as you described them, but I would ask like, why, why now if I was a business? Just give me the AI pitch. What's so important here? Sure. Uh, so the AI allows people generally either to automate things or to augment their capacity. And both of those capabilities are most needed in a very global world, right? We, are, we have like competition everywhere, everywhere in the world. We have like some part of the world where they are investing massively in automation. So imagine you are producing the same kind of products. All what you want is to deliver that product like faster, cheaper, more secure way. And with automation, for example, we can produce faster. We can deliver to the customer in the, uh, in the right moment because like big part of like the automation or the, like the value chain is automated. And basically we can reduce costs because almost it's, it's needed economically like for every organization to be able to sustain like their future and continue to innovate. So it's, it's, it's kind of like the AI technology today proved that the, like the value that it can bring, it's more than just research and reports, right? We today, we today, we can calculate very easily like the return on investment in terms of like cost reduction. Returns, for example, I would like to reduce the returns because every return that the customer is not satisfied, first, I pay like this returns. Second, there is a reputation that get affected every time. So put yourself like in, in a position of a Canadian manufacturing, for example, furniture manufacturing. All what I want is the product I send to my customer will not be returned because if it's, uh, if it's returned, I will pay that return. And in the same time, the customer is not happy and the customer will 
share like this information everywhere since we are in the internet uh, world, right? So I think it's it's time like to embrace this kind of technologies today. Thank you very much to answer that follow-up question. You talked about everywhere, there are no borders, well, which is true with technology and with markets. Glenn, that brings me to you, export markets, global opportunities. Let's face it, our own little province is too small. Our country is smallish. They are the global scale and the horizon that is endless, but it comes also with challenges and certain barriers. And uh, so how can EDC help or what is important as a company to consider if I wanna embrace exporting global markets and so forth? What advice do you have? I think it's a very important element with all these beautiful technologies. I think it's something we talked about. Yeah, so I mean, first we, we must recognize that Canada is a trading nation, right? As was previously mentioned. And we're, we're a large resource rich land, relatively small population and huge capacity to produce more than, than we consume. And when you start to layer on all of these innovations and these new technologies that Medi and others are talking about, that ability to produce continues to, to grow both here domestically, but also in the application of these technologies as we export the tech itself to the world. So, you know, as a result, goods and service trade represents about 66% of our total GDP. And so, nevertheless, that's a great uh, success and we do it well, but there is a lot of room for us to do better and to diversify those exports. So, as the vast majority of our exports continue to go to the United States, which there is nothing wrong with that, but if companies are to continue to grow and become global leaders in their field, they have to start looking beyond just our North American borders and look at truly as, as Mehdi, I believe mentioned, or Matt, this is really a global um, play, right? It, it's no longer just what can we do in Canada and how can we apply this technology to our own um, goods and services production. Second, it's proven exporters tend to perform better than non-exporters for many, many reasons. One, they specialize their production, which was already mentioned. By specializing, they enjoy economies of scale and they interact with and learn from their foreign consumers and competitors. And so as we continue to learn and face that stronger competitive pressure, that prompts the continuous investment in to improve our business practice and to improve our technologies, which is critical. So when you look at that environment, um, you know, research shows that exporters tend to be much more innovative. So the most innovative companies are exporters and those companies that want to innovate tend to end up being exporters because as they continue to innovate, they create markets globally for their products and services. And so our research shows that it's roughly, you know, exporters uh, invest roughly twice as much into R&D activities as non-exporters, which is a huge benefit to the economy as a whole here at home. But they're not just innovative. So exporters are productive as well. Uh, ex research shows a Canadian manufacturing sector finds that those manufacturers that export produce 13% more output per worker than non-exporters on average. And so this suggests that not only are exporting companies innovative, um, but that, that innovation helps improve the performance of the economy. In, in generally, the more intensely we can, you know, can to exports, the higher its overall productivity is. So innovation, adaption, um, um, it, it all leads to a greater overall economy for us. So um, when we look at this thing, you, you know, we've got large companies, we've got medium-sized companies, we've got small companies. Without question, the new exporters who are typically smaller, they enjoy the largest benefits from exporting because they grow the fastest, right? Uh, but as companies' global connected data increases, we then see the accumulative return come back to the performance improvements in terms of output, employment, and investment in physical, human, and R&D capital. So, you know, the innovation drives the new technology. The technology serves a purpose at home. We sell it globally, and that, you know, that that exposure continues to just, it's a secular thing that just keeps growing and growing. And so it just, you know, obviously we're going to say this, but I think the numbers prove for themselves that it's just good business sense to export and participate in the global economy. So this is a lot of words around growth. This is great. So it's a growth opportunity. So innovation, um, acceleration, you heard about growth in terms of your company, your size, your market, let's say revenue, we hope as well. 
clientele, customers. I would like now to move from here to with all that growth comes a growing risk. So I always think safety first, security first, cyber security, and somehow this I think brings me to you, Alexandre. How with our digital surface becoming bigger and bigger, more and more interconnected, everything, well, from, it is productivity optimization, but everything at a fast pace. So we have to be careful here as well, which I now look forward to hearing from you. What's your advice and your insights in terms of the opportunities and challenges out there and never to forget those. So safety first, I remember our conversation very well there. So please go ahead and Thank you. Yes, it's really exciting because we, we speak about export growth being leaders, acceleration being reactive. And with this whole process automation acceleration, we can see that the impact of an incident is as bigger as the acceleration take us. So the faster we are and the bigger the impact is of, is of an incident. Also, with the merging of the industrial sector toward the connected technology, we spoke about the Matt spoke about uh, collecting data, you know, for monitoring and AI and ML used for predictive, predictive failure analysis. There's a lot of data collection that is becoming a single point of failure on the chain of supply that, you know, complexify the external environment. So it's bringing a lot of challenging. And then at SDGT Vars, we, we work a lot on a digital transformation and something that we must not lose from site is the actual security and safety of all these processes. And someone said, we speak about people, process and technology. So that's quite interesting because all of this is really tied together and requires some strong governance to lead the change accordingly. I think Matt spoke about change management, which is extremely challenging, you know, bringing these new concept and variable in the equation of the production chain is quite challenging because we bring and we need to bring more actors like cybersecurity in the world of industry was not something like 10 years ago. You know, we had autonomous system, ICS, and it was just as Mehdi said, real time process, like industry is just real time. And there was no integrity, there was no security net because it was not connected. So to achieve this change now, we do connect everything. And when we do so, we have to merge the concept of cybersecurity and resilience from IT side of things to the industrial side of things, because there is a direct link between both of them. And something that IT world is not used to is that ICS world has real life impact. I mean, if you break something from a security standpoint in the infrastructure, in the industrial world, you're gonna have casualties and real life impact. It's not just data, you know, it can be affected production, like defective product shipped in the case of food and, and, and anything that is in the water treatment, we saw that you can lead to poisoning people if you don't have the integrity protected in that. So what was just data before is now a huge challenge. And I'm afraid when we speak about, you know, acceleration, growth, performance, and productivity, we shall not use insight that the security is a key factor into that. And you know, we, we see in the market a lot of lack of resource and that um, and the people are not uh, available, et cetera. But this is also because it's a complex task for these both world to work together. Like consulting digital transformation is one thing. Consulting on industrial system optimization and automation is one thing. And we see like the big player in industrial control system now come with cloud connected things and use AI and ML to do predict predictive failure analysis. So this is great because we can actually fix the thing before they break, you know, detecting anomaly in the, the collected data with all the telemetry and all. But he's also opening doors, which is growing, as you say, the attack surface of the infrastructure. So the more we connect, the most point we have to check and monitor to protect the safety of the process and infrastructure. So that would be my take on that first side of things. Thank you uh, very much for this, Alexandre. It's actually interesting listening to all of you, all these opportunities, and then we need to take a little breather and say, well, it comes at certain risks, which uh, I like, Matt and uh, Alexandre, you, you uh, referenced the people and the process and the change management. It is, at the end of the day, a people opportunity and people challenge as well, right? Um, those are the... Um, 
you know, the I would say the, the main actors because they use tech, well, they develop technology, they use it, they analyze it, they sell it, they implement it, they install it and so forth. There is some automation. I realize that maybe I don't want to uh, uh, ignore artificial intelligence has a lot of probably also going forward, um, doing a lot of these things as well. But um, thinking about this a little further, um, Matt, I wanted also to ask you in this context, and I, you, you spoke about IT resources and perhaps sometimes challenges with resources, which is an important topic. Funding comes to mind, financial resources as well. Um, so are there any specific government funding opportunities you could bring to the business's attention to tap into or other opportunities that you might suggest in order to either address an, uh, a resource bottleneck or an opportunity that might not be directly related just to government funding, but perhaps you have some insight there um, to share. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, so at any given time, there's probably about 3,600 different government incentive programs available. Um, you know, and uh, we work with a, a number of manufacturers and, and we actually have a whole in government incentives team at BDO that that's their, their role is, is to help you identify and align the right funding opportunities and, and work through the process and, and, and get the, the funds. Um, there are a number of different organizations that uh, and associations that focus on the manufacturing industry, such as uh, CME, the Canadian Manufacturers and Exporters. Um, also, NGEN is another big one, uh, working with a number of clusters across the country. Um, so I do, do a lot of work with those organizations. And uh, as I mentioned, there, there's literally thousands of opportunities out there. And, and the government's focus is really on at making Canadian manufacturers competitive and remain competitive and uh, creating jobs. It, it, it boils down to two very simple, specific objectives. Uh, and as I said, we've, we've got a team that helps you navigate through that process. If I, you know, from a, a, you know, what types of funding is available, it ranges from things such as training dollars to interest-free loans to grants, um, I, and it really depends. Um, and it's a moving target, which is why I can't can't be too specific because what I tell you today could be different tomorrow. And quite frankly, every time that the government changes, <laughs> the opportunities change. Um, but I, I've seen things from you know, literally thousands of dollars per employee for training uh, to millions of dollars for major initiatives. Um, so yeah, it, uh, uh, it, it is a, uh, there are a lot of options out there and uh, I would suggest uh, you, you, you can leverage the, go to the government website um, or reach out and, and get help. Uh, that's what I typically recommend because it is a complicated process. Well, as a follow-up question, as you and I had uh, connected on that specific topic uh, leading up to this conversation, if there is such an abundance, which is actually beautiful, but if it can, is a little bit challenging to uh, maybe tap into or identify um, what is really um, important or relevant to your company and eligibility criteria. Is there any specific advice, like one statement for the advanced manufacturing companies um, listening into this conversation or how to navigate such a abundance and actually generosity of programs out there and make use of them for, for those organizations and tap into them by, by experience? Yeah. I. I as I mentioned, um, I suggest reaching out to someone like we've got a government incentives team that that will help you navigate that process. Um, they'll go through and help you. They'll understand what it is you're looking to do. Um, they'll be able to quickly identify what funding incentives programs are relevant and uh, where you have a good chance to succeed in obtaining the funding. And then they can also help you navigate what's the application process. And you know, there are some, some follow-on things. It's not a matter of just to apply and get a check, frankly. Uh, sometimes, depending on the amount of funding, sometimes there's some 
monitoring and reporting that has to, to go along with that. Because as I, as I mentioned, I, I've seen some funding incentives uh, be in the uh, magnitude of millions of dollars. Uh, so there's a little bit more uh, scrutiny and reporting around that, but um, nonetheless, uh, it, it could be as simple as you know, putting in a new system and you're looking uh, for training dollars uh, just to get your people up to speed. Okay, fantastic. Thanks for that. So that, that's positive news all around, bringing me to the report you mentioned, CME, which is has also provided a great insights on, on many levels. Again, opportunities, but also barriers and challenges. And, and Glenn, you and I actually had connected on the CME report, and I do know that you have some more insights to share there because um, the report highlighted that finding new clients or business partners and developing export markets outside of Canada were actually identified as a top barrier for advanced wow. manufacturing growth in Canada. So um, how again could your organization address it and help with that? Yeah, thanks. I mean, so we, we hear this all the time. I mean, helping Canadian companies or exporters overcome barriers is really the core of what we do at EDC. And as Canada's international risk experts, you know, our primary role is to take on the risk so that Canadian companies can focus on taking the world, taking on the world and growing their businesses. So through our products and the services, risk mitigation services every day in terms of working with them to, to obtain financing, mitigate risk, working in new environments as they grow, grow globally and enter into new different uh, different markets and environments. And so through those activities with our clients and partners, we experience and learn very quickly about the changing business landscapes every day. And it's this partnership with our clients that, you know, really helps us um, to, to do better and to keep applying our learnings and helping other Canadian companies successfully enter into these markets. And so through this, we're always working within our global network. And through that global network, the experience is vast and it's wide. And it's that experience that feeds our ability to deliver, but it also allows us to leverage these connections and these different networks that are established around the world to the benefit of other Canadian companies. If you're to look to some of the other large you know, economies of the world, like the United States or Asia, um, much of this role of finding new markets and finding new buyers um, falls on the hands of, you know, large multinationals as they create export opportunities for small companies through their supply chains and through their own activities. But in Canada, in the absence of some of these large multi or comparable large multinational companies, um, EDC oftentimes steps in and plays that role. And so we have what we call our business connections program, um, which, you know, we use our connections and the activities we do abroad to make sure that Canadian goods and expertise are considered and are given every opportunity to be exposed to new businesses and to new global markets. Um, and we operate, I think, as Matt was saying, we do operate within this trade ecosystem. And we know that we're just we're one part of this overall ecosystem in Canada. And so as entrepreneurs continue to want to expand their business and they have an array of needs as they grow globally and as part of this ecosystem, um, you know, EDC, we can address many of those needs, but not all of them. And so we operate with other crown within a, you know, a system of other crown corporations, industry associates, banks, advisory service firms, and the private insurers that together we can meet all of those needs. And so um, what it really comes down to is, uh, you know, as Matt alluded to, it's reaching out, it's tapping into these networks and asking the questions. And while by, you know, if you need an export plan or you need advice around structuring your your plans to move into a new market, well, EDC may not deliver on that to specifically, but because we're part of this ecosystem, we know that BDO can, we know that BDC can, we know that there's other players that are, are available to help work with that. Introductions to new buyers, uh, the trade commissioner service has boots on the ground, as do we. We have our 16 offices where we work with uh, Canadian companies to uh, mitigate those those introductions to new new buyers and to new um, supply chains. So um, there's a ton of help out there. It's a uh, it's a uh, you know, as Matt said, there, there's hundreds of options available to companies that are changing constantly. And to think that a company's going to stay on top of that and know what it is, 
they don't need to do that. They just need to tap into the, the ecosystem at some point and know that they'll get the direction to point them into where they need to go. Wow, thank you. It's uh, another great insight and update on the uh, abundance of, of help uh, that's out there. I like uh, mention, the mentioning it's, it's a team effort. It's a collective effort and uh, all coming together and uh, tapping into the network, network and uh, taking advantage of it, uh, which brings me back as well to the network of connectivity, which is our so-called digital infrastructure. And there is cyber and the national security component, Alexandre, that you and I talked about, um, which I would also like to uh, bring into this picture one more time from a um, security first perspective. So. Given that, and you and I had connected on this, uh, technology always moves way faster than laws and also regulations, quite understandably. I mean, how can we ensure complex infrastructures and critical infrastructures um, continue to be uh, protected? And you called it the fail-safe approach, so, uh, which you would like to share with us here today. And I'm, I'm very keen to learn about it, what we have to recommend and then see how we can all implement it, yeah. Thank you. Yes, thanks for uh, raising this topic. Actually, yeah, the fail-safe approach is, you know, how can we continue to process when we got some failure and, and failure in our chain of command on the industrial side of things? So that's a challenging part. And actually, one of the solution to that is thinking security by design at the conceptualization of the process, you know? And so we, this is leading to security architecture of what we implant. That means that we will have security controls and overlapping security controls, which means that multiple controls to make sure that we protect the infrastructure. And the fail sale will be, how can we override a massive chain of event and restart? I you know in the cybersecurity world, it's called like MTTR, mean time to repair. How long is it gonna take to, to get back on track? Because with this high productivity rate, the longer we get off, the bigger the impact is. And we were speaking about actually, um, Glenn was speaking about the fact that this is an international, you know, being an international leader with all the export and the collaboration. And doing so is also bringing us as an international target because we are facing challenger from other countries all around the world. So the, the critical infrastructure, and I spoke about national security because this is you know, the, the national economy that is impacted by the industry. So if we get some disruptive attacks and interruption on this, this is going to jeopardize the position of the country and the economy of the country in the worldwide in the world position, because then we will be maybe taken over on some market because we were not able to achieve or deliver the expectation. So the security and the risk analysis is much bigger than just the, the technical side of things, you know, getting hacked or losing the data. It, it's, it has a wide, wide impact given the whole integration from the top world economy to the country down to the industrial production. So one of the key points is the public-private collaboration. Technically, kind of what we're doing right here, you know, sharing knowledge, sharing background, what the government side can help, what the official institution can help on the business side to achieve the goal, and what experts like us, like Medi, uh, can actually bring to organization to achieve and face the challenge in a safe way and also maintaining the productivity and the advance in technology and innovation. So that's a, a complex balance, and there is a needed cultural change, I would say, where you know, security and cybersecurity especially is seen sometimes as something that slow down the business or it's painful for production. Well, now, nowadays, cybersecurity talk business. We speak business. We understand the goal of the organization. We are not just blindly, stupidly focused on protecting the data. I may look like that from time to time, but <laughs> the thing is, <laughs> I apologize for that, but it's, it's risk-based decision, you know? And we follow protocol, we follow framework. There is nothing new. The fun fact is that dealing with that to protect the nation economy is not requiring new concepts or new frameworks. All the base, safety first, protecting people, protecting systems, overlapping security control are all concepts that are decades old. It's just a matter of when we design and when we move on these changes, we do have the proper hooks in the change management system to say, hey, What's the impact of that change on the security side of things? And sometimes it's just almost nothing. It's just designing it right. So we can actually achieve uh, proper resilience in, in the system. Uh, I'm not going too down into detail, but the threat landscape 
we saw uh, has been evolving. We saw, you know, everybody spoke of the pipeline attack in the US and the disruption it had on the economy and people were always out of gas and all that stuff. Well, that's a reality now, you know, poisoning of water supply. So we need to think about that and have redundant system and the fail safe approach is what if, you know, running this what if scenario. Uh, someone like um, one of the cele uh, celebrity in the cybersecurity world say, do your tabletop exercise, run your what if scenarios. If you didn't do it now, you can catch up. It's better to design, but if you didn't do it, oh, come on, go at every stakeholders around a table and run your what if scenario. What if we are hacked? Just take what's in the news and apply it to you. And that's going to raise the security posture. And then obviously you should I mean, work with specialists in the field. So you're gonna raise your maturity in that field. And sadly, the IT security maturity must be applied to the whole chain as well now. And we have to work together. Business, industry, technology has to work together. That would be it. <laughs> I, I really enjoy your passion. This is like, I hope it really translates into uh, implementation on the receiving end of the audience and that everybody, I must say, understands it as well. It can be sometimes a little bit complex or maybe intimidating and overwhelming. But uh, thank you for that energy you bring to the importance of cybersecurity uh, that maybe uh, more people should be uh, as energetic as you're about because it's such an important topic. Thank you so much. Thank and you. No, wonderful. Thank you, uh, uh, seriously. Not only in light of Cybersecurity Awareness Month, we should be really aware every day and uh, practice good cyber hygiene and a cyber culture. Um, Mehdi, um, having listened to Matt, Glenn and Alexandre, before we go uh, to questions from the audience, is there anything um, you wish to add um, while listening to everybody? Anything thought-provoking or any final statement just from your point of view? Absolutely. So I think uh, I really like it what Alexander uh, mentioned about, you know, security by design. And I think that's the way we should like uh, go now, like by designing like solutions where security matters like day one from the conceptual design of the solution. We think of security because uh, like Alexander said, like we, ne we need to run like the if this scenario happened, what, what, what should I do? And this, when we design a solution, including like this security like flavor could be very interesting. But in the same time, we need to think about uh, maybe last thought is there is the risk uh, of doing new innovative things, but there is another risk. What's, what is the risk of not changing? What is the risk of not doing things, right? And here we need to think about some good example and lessons in the economy where like some organization had 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 time to go into the change management uh, that's at the moment like they end up like out of business i think it's very important to find this balance between taking um measurable risk and there, there is tools and approach that exist like like security by design AI today, like there is tools to de-risk like the, the deployment of this kind of technology in manufacturing. So I think um, it's it's a great momentum. And uh, I saw like some questions about about like uh, what kind of talent we need, like for example, for, for the future of manufacturing. And I think for example, there is a huge opportunity on having talents that are like subject matter experts in a specific field on the manufacturing, but they have like, the capabilities, the technical capabilities and understanding at least of AI slash data science and data driven applications. So they can bring that flavor to manufacturing because they understand and they speak the language of the manufacturers, but in the same time, they master like the tools that they can like effectively impact like those organizations. Well, thank you, Mehdi. You actually brought, um, provided a great segue to the questions, and you were, uh, which we have uh, found in the chat box there. Now, this is great talent. Um, it's one topic. If anyone else on this panel would like to feed into that conversation, um, that uh, it is uh, the, the question actually reads uh, What is needed from the talent side to support future manufacturing? What skills and training are needed? by businesses. Is there anyone who would like to answer this in more detail or add anything to what Nadi just said? 
I can kick things off. I think, um, you know, when you think about the manufacturing industry and um, are we knowledge workers, um, you know, and, and the challenge with offshoring manufacturing, et cetera. I mean, that, that debate's been going on for years and, and that momentum, frankly. Um, skills today, when I think about the younger generation getting into, um, you know, what, what are they going to school for? What are they looking for? Um, you know, far more advanced, far more uh, digitally enabled, um, you know, I'll sort of date myself here, but uh, I remember when I was trying to think about what do I want to do? I mean, it was very easy to say, hey, if you wanted to be a manager, that kind of gave everybody a general uh, indication as to what you were trying to do, where today there, you could Google a manager roles and there would literally, literally be a million opportunities would pop up and they'd all be different. Um, I think the skill sets required today are people that are digitally uh, aware, which most kids are, frankly. Um, you know, kids these days, I, I think a four year old probably knows how to use a, a phone better than my grandmother, for example. Um, but uh, um, digitally aware, digitally curious. How do we, and you know, part of the conversation about AI and, you know, I had mentioned augmented reality and virtual reality and those types of technologies, uh, you know, uh, hardware and software, robotic process automation. How do we, or how can you be digitally aware and curious and innovative, recognizing that it, it's, it's technology is embedded in everything we do. I, I do a number of these events and I tell people, um, you know, basically, if you don't think you're a technology company, I would suggest you may not be around in five years because you're going to be displaced by the competition. And I know that's a very bold statement, but I don't mean a technology company is like writing code and that sort of thing, but you have to be digitally enabled, digitally transformed. It is critical to the success of our manufacturing economy to be, you know, thinking about Glenn's comments, to be global, not only nationally com competitive, but globally competitive, because if you're not doing it, others will. Well, and along, thank you very much, Matt, uh, for expanding on that further. And, and actually along the lines of talent, staff, and the risk, uh, there is another question which addresses a different group, the executive management group, like, so we talked about, which talent, what should you prepare for? How should you educate yourself and look at the future? Now you are within the workforce, executive management. So the question is here, how shall the executive management of firms deal with key technology risks, given that IT and AI project staff, they do actually have a high risk tolerance? Not sure anybody would like to take this question um, around, uh, on, on that, um, Alexander? Oh, yeah, yeah, I can it. start on that. And I see maybe we'll maybe add some stuff on that. But they need actually translator, you know, people that know both mm -hmm. the business side and the technical side and that can actually bring value to the message. And usually it's two ways, quantitative analysis of the risk and qualitative analysis. Basically translate what can happen and what would be the impact in numbers. And then they can make a proper decision according to the risk they take. So the executive management, you know, they have strategy, long run economical perspective, projection, growth, and all of that. But the risk side, not from a financial side of things, but from the industrial side of things, and which is basically what we do in cybersecurity as well, as measuring proper KPI and put number that will allow them to decide whether the risk is acceptable, if it has to be compensated, or if it's not worth it. And that will drive the business decision. Sometimes it can be kind of complex because we don't know about the innovation. We don't have a background in that. So we, we are not sure about the potential impact, but yet we should you know, assess number, use some guesstimate and, and decide actually uh, with that data and then adjust on the way. And also about the same, you know, it's the same thing with the skills and the quick pace, pace of evolution of technology. We must be constant learning learner adjust, you know, real time stuff and time to short time to market. This is the same thing with the decision making process. It's a shorter cycle. We cannot do a roadmap for years because we know it's going to go on a side or another and we must be able to adjust. That would be my side. Maybe, maybe, maybe you want to add something. 
agree, uh, Alexander. And I think uh, I think basically, uh, you know, there is a change even uh, like that I personally experienced it with the, the high executive today. We have more and more tech savvy executives. It's not like like maybe ten years ago. It's very different. Like the conversation is different. People are aware about like uh, the technology readiness of their organizations. They they know the truth from the false, like regarding tech. So this helps a lot. Um, for example, you know, coming from a startup world, and now I move it to like a more corporation, global corporation, where like the offer is like we have risk advisory, but in the same time, like we we have the tech consulting and deep deep tech consulting so there is a way to de-risk projects uh, either like through uh, through like uh, literacy like basically helping people to understand but also even in terms of execution like there is different like approach where we can try to build proof of value and proof of concepts to basically de-risk like uh, the first steps that an organization take toward like the technological change and then like those kind of uh, quick success, it will help like people to better like um, better, let's say absorb and better, let's say embrace like the, the change and the adoption of, of the tech. So I think, uh, I think again, like uh, we have, we have a not bad, let's say um, like momentum in terms of, in terms of like uh, readiness, like people are, are pretty much ready, I think. In Canada, at least. Is there any anything else anyone wishes to add on that front, or I otherwise take the freedom and look at one more question? We have three more minutes, um, so it's exciting. A lot of questions have come in. Um, perhaps a little bit um, of knowledge and um, knowledge sharing on three D printing. There's the question: If this is being utilized, um, are there any specific examples? And a, a reference was made to Japan. And um, is there anyone who, who wishes to enlighten the audience here? I see you're not, Alexander, or on the media. Everybody is waving. So three D is a hot topic. Yeah. I, I start. Matt, why don't I? May I start with you, and then we go around? <laughs> okay, please go ahead. Sure. Yeah. I mean, 3D printing is is becoming very popular. Um, you know, if you think about prototyping, um, like rapid prototyping, uh, I was watching a, a, some material the other day where they're actually 3D printing a, a homes for, from the ground up. Like, and you know, uh, if you think about uh, printing materials. Um, or, or even if you're if you're trying to get your products to market, um, and if you think about the distribution network, maybe it's difficult to ship things to a certain area, and 3D printing could be a viable option. And uh, it's amazing how much that technology has evolved. Um, and it doesn't have to be that costly. I mean, 3D printers range from like you know minimal amounts to like hundreds of thousands right like it's you can spend a lot of money on them but um, they can be they can put a lot of flexibility agility adaptability creativity etc innovation uh, uh into your your manufacturing business and i do apologize i i do i have a hard stop so i'm gonna have to drop off in a minute thank you very much matt for for sharing this and we do have another minute so a few seconds, Alexandra and Mehdi, can you, uh, uh, I, I don't want you to speed talk, but um, perhaps yeah, you that's... start sharing and I'll be quiet, okay. <laughs> Happy to jump on the 3D printing side. I mean, this is a change between the factory industrial processing in chain and the factorization for producing on demand. Actually, you know, when you dismantle a chain of production because a product is going out of production, you cannot support it anymore, like in the automotive industry. Mm -hmm. Now, free industrial 3D printing is changing that by allowing industry to produce on demand. And the, 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 you don't need the big chain of production anymore to actually shape an actual full product. You can just build a part on demand. So this is a going, going to be when the product get there, and I mean, the, the product used to 3D print, and it, when it becomes, it's soon to be there as reliable as the industrial production of parts, that's gonna be a huge change because basically, you won't need big manufacturing chain and robot as we know it now 
it's going to be much more dynamic and adjustable. So it's going to be a revolution. It's going to take some years, but it will change the things. So that would be my take on that. <laughs> Excellent take on that, uh, by the way, Alexandre. And I agree. Like uh, there is the revolution comes like out of basically um, like a sort of a revolution in terms of IP and in, the, in terms of research and development. I I had the chance like to work like with many uh, Japanese manufacturers, like especially automotive manufacturers, uh, like for years. And I think uh, 3D printing will bring a room for disruption. Because, for example, they took, like in the question uh, they mentioned, like Japanese automotive manufacturer, for example, like those companies, like they fine tuned their processes for years and years, tens of years. And with the three printing, it allows like to new player, new disruptor to bring like similar kind of quality and fine quality very, very, very fast without like doing like the, that process. So I think it's it's a big opportunity like to let new player enter like very hard to get in markets, let's say. So interesting topic. Well, thank you very much. That was Glenn, while we have, uh, do you want to add anything to 3D or you're all good there? 3D and global markets. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you everybody, all the panelists and Matt, I had to drop off a big thank you as well. Mehdi, Alexandre, Glenn, it has been a real pleasure. It has been highly engaging, greatly informative and insightful. I learned a lot. I'm sure the audience learned a lot. And thank you to the audience as well and my wonderful team behind the scenes.